who are here this morning to worship with us on this uh, lovely uh, January day, Jan January morning of this weekend for all of us who are um, <laughs> living in the Pacific Northwest who are under very gray, drizzly skies this morning. Um, we will um, be uh, uh, seeing this morning. I invite you to follow along with the words. Uh, belt it out. If you're at home, you're on mute. You can sound like anything you'd like uh, with the songs that we're going to be singing this morning. Um, the only time you will be unmuted is uh, when you are speaking, and I would invite you to unmute yourself to do that. And um, you may also unmute during the prayers of the people. If you have something that you would like to specifically hold up, a person or uh, something, um, please unmute yourself at that particular moment and share that if you would like, um, if, that's your, if that's your preference. Otherwise, welcome to worship. We're going to ring the bell, have a moment of silence, and Julie uh, will begin to play in about 30 seconds after that. Oh, she, what she's doing? Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Saying together, Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, 
receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Shannon, did we lose Shannon? Shannon, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? There you go. Okay. Sorry, Pat had to fix it. Okay, um, the first reading, well, the reading is from Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 23. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater inequity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you now are ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin, and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm this morning is Psalm 13, joining together after the first verse. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I have perplexity in my mind and grief in my heart day after day? How long shall my enemy triumph over me? Look upon me and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, lest I sleep in death. 
lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him and my foes rejoice that I have fallen. But I put my trust in your mercy. My heart is joyful because of your saving help. I will sing to the Lord, for he has dealt with me richly. I will praise the name of the Lord Most High. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly, I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I have to start out this morning by saying that in my 16 years at St. Clair's, there have been five times when the Old Testament reading this morning is dedicated to the story of Abraham nearly sacrificing his son Isaac. This Sunday would be that day. And as we're only using one lesson, including and the gospel, I decided that I'm going to spare myself and you all from having to come up with one more reason why this challenging story is included in our scriptures. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, I invite you to go look up the story in Genesis chapter 22 and then get in touch with me and we'll talk. We have enough going on without dealing with child abuse, human sacrifice, and trying to prove our love for God is more than anything or anyone else. I'm not sure that talking about slavery is any easier, especially considering all that's going on in the world today and our complicity with that. But I'm hoping that Paul's words in his letter to the Romans can be something we can sort of tease out. We are all slaves to something. Sometimes those things do more to destroy our goodness and nearness to God than help us to achieve anything good or useful. We all can also enslave other things other, for, or other people for our own sense of entitlement. Those things usually end up destroying the essential goodness of whatever it is we have co-opted for our own benefit. Bob Dylan once sang, you gotta serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you gotta serve somebody. 
in our reading in Romans this morning, Paul is saying something kind of like that. He doesn't mention the devil, but he does say that we all serve either sin or righteousness, law or grace. And he says that we will inevitably be the slaves of one or the other. I think most of us know which side we'd rather be on, but more often than not, it's so dang hard to choose that right side, that good side. And it's so much easier to make a deal with the devil just this once or twice and try like crazy to justify our actions. Our justification that slavery over black people was okay came out of an understanding that people of color were not fully human. It was okay to treat them like animals or to give them only three-fifths of a vote because they weren't like the people who were making the laws. They were set apart because they were unlike us. And it was okay that they serve a master because the Bible speaks plainly about being a slave and being a good one at that. Our justification about making money being the sign of success has led to individual and corporate greed, economic disparity between the few who have way too much and the many who have way too little. Those who write the laws sustain the inequity between the haves and the have-nots. And it is also the cause of untold heart attacks, ulcers, divorces, and alcoholism. We are all the slaves to something. We all enslave something. How do we hear the words of the Apostle Paul and seek and serve righteousness and grace, especially when those aren't usually the glamorous or easy options in the moment of self-preservation? In Paul's word, world, those who followed the law could not see that there was another option. In God's economy, the first are always the last. The poor are the rich and the law gets overruled by grace. The law is good and necessary, and there is no question we need it to keep social order. Descending into chaos does not create healthy systems anywhere, and that's not the point. I think Paul is saying to the people around him that they are clinging to something, to a law that they can uphold as a standard to identify themselves as being good and as somebody else being not so good or bad. In his day, if you ate pork, you were bad and therefore unclean and sinful. But if you didn't eat pork, you were a good and holy person. God would bless you. And that posed a problem. We still do this today. The law becomes a slave driver that rules over us and leads us to create more divisive, more divisiveness, more cruelty, and more laws. We do this as individuals, as groups, and institutions. And the church is as guilty as anyone here. Over the centuries, we have kept people away from the scriptures by denying them to be able to read or converse or to pray in their own native language. We did that for centuries, centuries, and it caused an incredible upheaval and unrest when it finally switched over so people could read in their own language, hear in their own language, and seek and serve God in their own language. Today, we keep the sacraments in the hands of the clergy only, so it becomes an exclusive activity just for a few to do. That may be changing as we bump up against how we do communion. Paul says, this is opposed to the message of Jesus who offers grace so freely, we don't even know what to do with it. We are afraid that if we make the law unimportant and the consequences of doing something irrelevant, then evil will take over the world. That too misses the point. It seems to me that's not a problem with evil. Evil has a life of its own. We don't have to do anything to make evil be. 
The law does not make us good. It never did and it never will. Not eating pork probably kept a lot of people from getting sick. Well, that was no longer an issue. The law evolved into something that set people apart from one another. The law doesn't touch our hearts to break down the laws that tend to get cruel or divisive. The law establishes boundaries that with grace, our hearts can come to see as unhelpful or unnecessary or even unholy. Likewise, the law doesn't call us into action or transformation. Enter grace and the somebody you might choose to serve. And Bob Dylan's words come back to us. You got to serve somebody. Jesus' understanding of grace and our embracing it opens the way of being truly loving and hospitable to sharing what we have with others, especially those who are unlike us. Grace calls us to understand where we've gone wrong with the law and the best way to correct it. The hardest part about grace is that it's free. We can't buy it or earn it or trade for it or barter for it. And most of all, we can't legalize it to make it be only for a privileged few. The law would regulate grace and dole it out like wages or payment for good behavior. In other words, you get what you pay for. If you mess up, you get what you deserve. And the law would say that we will earn our way to heaven. Nothing could be more wrong or deadly. With grace, you get the gift of eternal life. And it is always way beyond anything we could ever dream of or wish for or hope for. The Bible says you cannot serve two masters. In these days when we are recognizing how the law has often kept us divided, I would ask that we send some time this week seeking God's grace. Ask for it. When you wake up in the morning, first thing you should think about, or you might think about, is to ask for God's blessing and ask for God's grace. Ask God to show you where the law has kept you from seeing this grace. Explore ways that you might share this grace with somebody who may have been subjected to laws that demean or discredited or discriminated or even held them back from being made whole in our sight because they already are whole in God's sight. Let us give them the privilege of that in our society it doesn't take a law, it takes grace, and it's free. Bless you all, this day and always. Be filled with that grace, but don't take it for granted. It may be free, but it is free also to give away and to challenge the laws that keep people from recognizing that freedom belongs to all of us. In the name of God, amen. I invite you to join me in reciting the Nicene Creed found on page four of your bulletins this morning. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. 
On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray to the God whose way of love claims our heart's first loyalty and leads us on the path to abundant life, saying, Holy God, your mercy is great. For the church, especially for Michael, our presiding bishop, and Greg, our bishop, Patty, our priest, that we may reach out in welcome with Christ's healing love to all who enter our lives. Holy God, your mercy is great. For this congregation gathered today, that in Christ we may find the free gift of life and the reward promised to the righteous, holy God. Your mercy is great. For all who suffer violence, live in fear, or are cast out because of their race, sexuality, or any other reason, that they may discover the power of God's love and peace in us as we live our baptismal promises. Holy God, your mercy is great. For this nation that God will guide us in living the values which we proclaim so that all may experience life, liberty, and justice. Holy God, your mercy is great. In thanksgiving for this good earth, our common home, that we may work to preserve it so that it, uh, all God's creatures may be blessed by it. Holy God. Your mercy is great. <clears throat> For those in need of our prayers, uh, remembering especially, and I'm gonna pause here, you can fill in names. Dylan. For Dylan, for Niall and Marilee, for Jim, Gary, Gail, Sally, Elaine, Barb, that they may know your healing love and abiding peace, holy God. Your mercy is great. For all the departed, remembering especially. that they may now enjoy the reward Jesus promised to the righteous, holy God. Your mercy is great. Lifting our voices with all creation, let us offer ourselves and one another to the living God through Christ, to you, O Lord, holy, holy God. God of eternal God of life, eternal whom we love more than life itself. Hear our prayers for the needs of your people and give us strength to follow where you have led the way. This we ask in your most holy name. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The 
peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. This morning in our offertory basket, I have the names of all those who have made generous um, financial contributions to the ministry of St. Clair's. I would invite you um, in your own homes this morning to uh, hold your hands together, or maybe you have a, your own little basket, um, and you have put things that you are grateful that you are giving back to God in thanksgiving for your life. Um, and as uh, we allow um, our thanks to be raised, I would invite Lydia to uh, sing the doxology. Okay. I invite you to share with me the prayer uh, when communion is not possible this morning. Saying together, in union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, I desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving. I remember your death, Lord Christ. I proclaim your resurrection. I await your coming in glory. Since I cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart, cleanse and strengthen me with your grace. Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you and you in me, in this life and in the life to come, amen. Saying together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God of seasons and Sabbath, God of our days and our hearts, you bless us with greening time that we might be renewed. Teach us to live slowly and taste the goodness of your love. Show us how every moment is alive with you, far from ordinary, trembling with hope, shining with glory. Through Christ who found you in corners of quiet and whose arms we find rest, amen and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you this day and always. Amen.
Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia.